of a, a small society, of a wee world within a world, coming together and giving what little had to others. Could you give an example of that? Or what, what? One example I remember, well, going just there when I lived down in the falls, I remember a time when like this, all the doors were left open, by and large. And one of the reasons one of the doors were left open, doors were left open as well, I believe, is that you know when the state was coming in, they were brutalising and beating and shooting people. Then people could run through the houses and out the back, and I did it in many occasions as a child myself, with the soldiers and to- uh, and, and following me, going get the wee black bastard, the wee black bastards there, there's the wee nigger and stuff like that. But there were so many wee wide and alleyways in them days, and I, and I think that was one of the reasons why they've restructured the way the, the houses are being built, closing off alleyways and stuff as well, because they were really utilised by the, uh, the IRA volunteers um, within the times, and also utilised by the community themselves. But in regard to one of the one of the situations, I remember a time when they were in the falls, rats was going on really, really heavily. The, um, uh, the, as I said earlier on, the big tractors were coming up, and this time when they were removing the bonfire wood, and we as kids, you know, we're getting wired into them with whatever we had had at hand. But there's just one t- particular guy who was probably about five years older than me. I would say at that time he was probably about 14, 15. And he was literally in his bare feet. And he had little, literally rags on him. And I remember the woman, we lived in number six of Ostapur Street, the woman directly across from us. Um, Mrs. Murphy, you call her? I remember her coming out and um, actually giving her a coat that one of her sons actually owned, who I used to knock about with, down there. And my own mum gave him her shoes and someone else gave him, gave him trousers. And there was no, there was no luck down on someone because they needed it. It's because everyone had little, but what little had to give, as I said before. Then there was other times, I remember, in, in our house in Sevastopol Street, when those uh, people... Is this when you move? You move from the Bell Murphy to Falls, eh? Yeah, I'll go back to Bell Murphy in a minute, but in regard to different experiences of community solidarity, there was times also whenever people who had completed an album came from the streets, who were living in the streets. I remember a time we, in, in the last post street we had a wee pineapple full of coppers, and my mum would always keep it for people to come along and give them the money, even though we had very, very, very little, you know. But in regard to the Murph, as I said, you know, I started feeling different, I started being treated different by the forces of the state and stuff as well. But then when you actually witnessed the brutality of the state, I witnessed women getting their teeth smashed out by um, bayonets of guns. I witnessed dogs who used to bark at the street, I bark at the, I bark at the soldiers. And, you know, I even heard years down the line, you know, that some dog was even buried in its food, food, um, food colours. Do you know what I mean? Um, because why well, that's true, I don't know. But the dogs were like a warning signal when the, the when the state came in. But um, uh, I witnessed the brutality of the state there, you know. And when you actually see it firsthand, right? When you see people you love being battered, abused, and beaten off the streets, then you you can only take so much. You really can only take so much. And this is in tandem with the the racist abuse that I was given, and even the the beatings, even at an early age, you know, by the by by growing soldiers you know what I had was a, a, a childhood which had nothing but I was a I was a fun loving kid I was a really fun loving kid I liked life you know I was a I was I just was a nice kid you know what I mean but then because of that then it started slowly to turn towards hatred and you know I actually seen myself physically change I could see my face I could see my eyes changing to a fun loving spark of a kid in youth to just complete nothing. It was nothing this there. So those actions were drove a reaction into me and even at a very young age, seven or so, it forced me to do what I could to fight back against the state. And I can fully understand the political circumstances that driven young men and young women into the ranks of those who could provide the means and the direction to head back at the state because my own feelings of immense hatred and that's get back at the bastards at a seven year old kid if they were intensified to a 17 year old kid then I can fully understand why people took up the gun I may not necessarily agree with it 
as they're, 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 that's why I'm in the organisation I am now, but I can fully understand it. And there was many innocent killed um, by many sides during the period of the war. So Battle Murphy to me was an experience of where I first had an innocent childhood, where I can remember that sparkle of eye, where I can remember the, the kids games, where I can remember being a child. But it's also because I used to go between my grandmother's house and then we moved to Sevastopol Street, it was also where... What age did you move to Sevastopol Street at? Well, my, we, we moved there probably about in the mid-70s, I would say. About 74, 75. Well, I did anyway. I went from living with my grandmother. When I left my grandmother's house, you know, because I was living with my grandmother, my mother had remarried. She got married in Corpus Christi to my stepfather. Um, he was also from the Belmar Free Estate. He was married by the famous priest, um, Father Dallas Wilson. There have a wee picture of my staff standing there in a wee white shirt and a wee, wee shorts about three years of age or so. So moved down to Sylvester Street. And so to give them a breathing space, um, to, get, to, to get the guy and to begin their lives to and to get the home sorted out, that um, I lived with my granny most of the time. And then over the years, I went from my grandmother's house to... My, my my own house, family home, and then stay with my grandmother at, at the weekends. So mm -hmm. that's the way it operated for a, a, a couple of years. It was actually when we moved to Sevastopol Street, and I found out years there that the house that we uh, actually got had belonged to uh, Seamus Twomey, mm -hmm. which was the, the IRA's chief of staff, um, I think at that period of time. So we had got that house there. Um, so moved in there about the mid-70s. What about education, etc? What school did you go to? Well, I started school in a really good school. It was very strict, which was just around the corner from me in Zavascoe Street. It was called St. Um, I think it's in a further education centre now. And beside, a couple of doors down my street, it was the Sinn Féin centre, um, where you'd seen, the, I think it was uh, the early 80s when Jay Adams won, won his first seat as and PM standing out on the balcony, you know, waving to the, the, the people there. Um, there was a Symphian Centre. I remember there was a, there was like next door, I think it may have been on that, but there was like machines used to play all the time, you know, uh, the money machines and stuff. And I remember putting money in and just kept winning when I knew where it was coming from, putting it in my pockets and running, Jesus, I'm a millionaire. I was about three pounds or something. Do you know what I mean? But I, I went to Symphian School and, and, um, on the Falls Road, and I was taught by um, Christian brothers. Um, there was teachers, I still remember teachers, Miss O'Hara and Mrs. Milani, but then we got taught by Brother Christopher, and he was really into Gaelic football, uh, the Gaelic games and stuff. They were very, very strict. In the end days, you know, you know, if you did wrong, you know, I remember taking occasions where you were slapped in the hands, or occasions where you're bent on the desk, your cacks are pulled down, you're whipped by meter sticks, and spit by meter sticks and all. That was a reality at the time. I didn't think nothing about lifting you by the, the earlugs or the, the, the lock of hair behind your ear, giving you a slap around the head. That was the reality of the time. But even at a very young age, I have to say I was involved, I was really interested in sport. And I remember going up and playing sport, I think it was Beachmore Ledger's time there, playing Gaelic and stuff like that there. You know, and there was one particular moment I really remember uh, in them days was I was meant to play a Gaelic final, I was still, still a child, and for the first time I got on to um, a roundabout called, owned by a guy called Mickey Marley, and I was on his roundabout and I was sick as a dog, and I couldn't play the Gaelic final, so it's wee memories like that, you know, they keep coming to the fore every now and again. But in regard to, as I was saying, of, you know, being driven to react, you know, what happened when I lived there, it was again, it was a centre of everything, you know, you remember, you know, the, the riding, you remember the bonfires, you remember the, the big tractors, you remember the Brits, you remember the Peters, you've seen people shot, you've seen people beaten, you've seen people brutalised, you know, all those different things you actually seen. And so eventually it did drive a reaction into me. And I remember when that reaction happened, I actually started visibly to see the change in my eyes from the sparkle gone to absolute nothing. And I walked out the door of my house in 6th of Street 
and they started picking up bricks and 